Yes, we have lots to share. We need a lot of wisdom. All right, I, I, I get a sense of that wonderful hush <laughs> before we start. Hey, welcome to Forest Hill Church. I'm John Lentz. I'm the pastor here. Uh, and it's wonderful to see you, friends. I see members and, and friends from clergy and friends from all over, and that's very good. Um, I can't really begin. I, I don't really have uh, words, although being a preacher, you know, we find words to say <laughs> how thrilled I am to be introducing and, 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 and welcoming back to her one of her spiritual homes, uh, the Reverend Dr. Professor Kimberly R. Wagner, Professor of Preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary. But the Reverend Dr. Professor Kimberly R. <laughs> Wagner, Professor of Preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary, will always be Kimberly and Kim to me, and I hope that that's okay, that, we, that I cross I, over that. No, but, titles make me nervous. No, but you know. earned them, and man, we got to celebrate them. I, you know, but the Wagners, um, uh, her family worshipped at Forest Hill Church for a better part of 10 years and made an extraordinary impact on the life of this church in so many, many ways. And, uh, and, and Kim was actually under care of our presbytery. Right? Yeah. Yeah, right. So uh, this is just, you know, so before all this higher education and all these credentials, um, she was uh, a daughter of this church. Of, and I, I know that pride goeth before the fall, but I'm willing to take a fall because I'm, I just, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Kim was outstanding then. She is outstanding now. Um, Kim will be preaching on Sunday at 11 o'clock. So come on back. Um, and I'm so uh, delighted that Kim is here today. Although, frankly, your topic, your book, what you're going to be uh, bringing us is, is quite sobering. Uh, she's written a, an extraordinarily important book. Um, her first, I believe. Yeah. Right. This is fantastic. Fractured Ground, Preaching in the Wake of Mass Trauma. Uh, any of us who are alive today and read the newspapers, we know about the weekly mass shootings, uh, the riots and the insurrections, the environmental havoc uh, that, uh, that beset us all. How does a preacher, uh, how do parishioners stand in that tension and, and speak and listen and, and, and get grounded in the good news of, of Jesus Christ and it's the daily horror news of the headlines? Um, how does a preacher speak to the fractured narrative of our time? I love that phrase, fractured narrative. I'm going to be using that a lot. Right. Well, we're going to talk. About and I will footnote you every single time. <laughs> until it becomes so part of me that I'll just say, it, I've yeah. heard it sad and then it, whatever. Yeah, until it's just like, and as I penned just last week, that's right. Uh, how do we keep our faith? How do we even keep our sanity? And I think many of us in the clergy and in those, you know, in chaplaincy and in any kind of helping profession, I mean, how do you just stay grounded in your own stuff? So it's to these questions and others that Kimberly have sought answers, or at least insights, and trying to give some direction to all of us. So the format is this. Professor Wagner will come and give your presentation, and then there will be some time for questions and answers. Uh, she did bring some books, and she's got her little scanner, so um, uh, if, you want, if you want that book, I, I recommend it highly. I think it's an extraordinary read, and it really meant a lot to me. Um, since I'm a preacher and we're in church, can I gather us in a word of prayer? You know, gracious God, thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us in safety to this place. Thank you for Kimberly, and bless her. You have called her for this moment. You've called her to this, this time to shine a light into the shadows, to stand in the breach of our fractured lives, to speak a word of hope to a world hungering and thirsting for redemption. So be with us now. Call us into your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Professor Amen. Wagner, take it away. Let's give it up for Emily Wagner. You like, yeah, thank you. I need to bring you along as my, my hype man it. for everything. I promise no. I'll carry your books. I'll I love it. it. I love it. I love it. No, it is such a joy and a privilege and a pleasure to be with you all today and to share a little bit about my work with hopes that it will be helpful for you all as you think about how we preach and minister and live faithfully in these times. So 
Um, just a kind of invitation, a content warning invitation to self-care. Um, we are going to talk about trauma. It's in the title, but I always like to remind people that's what we're talking about. Um, and also, we're going to talk about different kinds of trauma. So we'll talk about mass violence. We'll talk about COVID, um, pandemic, of course. We'll talk about natural disasters. Um, so please pay attention to your body. Uh, pay attention to your mind, your spirit, your body. If you need to step out, please do so. Um, I'm not offended. Um, this is an invitation I extend every time I talk and to every class. I teach a preaching and trauma semester-long course, and I start with this every time because it's important for us to pay attention to how we are responding to things. All right, so um, our plan for our time today. First thing I want to do is help us to understand trauma and its impact on individuals and communities. Because uh, I think understanding what's actually happening is a really helpful way to respond faithfully. Um, and then we're going to explore some faithful response uh, to trauma in communities. And then we're going to seek some wisdom from some biblical ancestors. So um, that's the plan for the day and plenty of time for conversation. So um, please keep those questions coming. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is I think it is really helpful to understand these days through the lens of trauma. It isn't the only lens we should use, obviously, right? I don't want everything to be seen through the lens of trauma. However, I think that the, the tools that trauma and trauma studies gives us allows us to recognize and give language to some of the things that are going on in ways that we might not otherwise be able to notice them or pay attention to them. So I always start by saying I think it is very helpful to understand these days through the lens of trauma but it is not the only way to do it, right? But this is the lens I want to bring to this conversation. So the first thing is we have to get our definitions in place, right? This is where you see the academic side of me. I, this presentation, hopefully you'll see that combination of pastoral and academic. But as a good academic, we have to get our definitions in place. So how do we define trauma? Well, I think there are four reasons why it's actually a challenge to define trauma. And the first reason is it's often used as a colloquial term. I once heard a student, overheard a student the other day say, oh, I ran out of coffee this morning. It was totally traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, a, as, as one who lives off of coffee, um, more than I'd like to admit, uh, I get that sentiment, but that's not actually trauma, right? <laughs> like, that's not, that's not technically trauma, but we have started using it as a colloquial term, right, to show extreme emotion or, or, or as almost an emphasis, right, as hyperbole. And so that kind of can, can muddle how we define trauma. The second reason is that even when we use it precisely and well, trauma has become a catch-all term for multiple types and kinds of trauma. So everything from a mass shooting to a natural disaster to individual traumas like abuse or a traumatic illness or traumatic loss, all the way to historical and generational traumas like racism and white supremacy or LGBTQIA plus discrimination. Trauma is the word we use, even when we use it technically and well, that encapsulates all of those things, right? The response to all of those different experiences. And so it's hard to define because it's, it's a little nebulous in that way. The third reason I think it's hard to define is because we often conflate trauma and the traumatic event. And I think it's really important that we hold them apart. And I want to be really clear. A lot of scholars don't do this really well, and it makes me crazy. But for me, I think it's important to hold them apart, and for two reasons. The first is that trauma is the subjective experience of an event. So that means a whole group of people or a set of communities could experience the same event, but have different experiences of the trauma. Right? Um, a simple example is when I was, so my first life, um, my first professional life, I was a science teacher. Um, and I was on my way to school and got, you know, a five car pileup. I was car number four on a five car pileup. And gratefully walked away. Everyone was able, everyone survived. All the cars were crushed, but somehow we all miraculously walked away. Well, about six months later, we all got called to court because insurance companies are fun. And um, I remember meeting these other drivers, um, and all of them had different responses 
right to the accident. For me, it was scary. It was a hard day. I was a little nervous behind the wheel. I had to get a new car. But for others, they weren't able to drive on that highway or a highway. There was even one woman who just hadn't gotten behind the wheel of a car since the accident. And so that same event that we all experienced, we each had different tra trauma responses, right? And so I think it's important to hold them apart because the last thing we want to do is we don't want to prescribe trauma based off of the event. So if this event happens, this is how folks should respond. There is no should in trauma. Trauma is a subjective experience of the event. The second reason I think it's important to hold them apart is because a traumatic event has a beginning, a middle, and hopefully some kind of end or subsides in some way. Trauma lingers by definition. And in fact, individuals and communities sometimes can't even begin to conceive of the depth and breadth and, and, and situation of their trauma until there is a sense of safety. Um, one of the uh, uh, grandmothers of, of trauma uh, theory and trauma recovery, Judith Herman, she talks about stages of recovery, but she says some of the later stages, they mix and match, but the very first stage that has to happen is the establishing of safety. And that's emotional safety, physical safety, spiritual safety. And until that happens, people sometimes and communities can't even begin to conceive of their trauma. And so if we conflate trauma and traumatic event, we might make the mistake of saying, well, the event's over, you should be fine. Mm, come on. Right? And we're not. In fact, we are just now, I think we as a country, we as communities, we as communities of faith, are just now contending with the trauma from the pandemic. Because it is just in recent, within the year, that we have been safe to gather, right? Um, Safe-ish to gather, right? Um, and, and, and it's just now, I think, communities are starting to contend with what lockdown meant. The trauma that came from the loss of the pandemic, the losses that came that were uh, both physical and, and, and interpersonal losses, right? And so we need to be careful not to conflate them. And then the last reason it's hard to define is just the nature of trauma itself. Um, Kathy Carruth says that trauma is known only in the gaps of our experience. And what she means by that is that trauma is that which we cannot make sense of. It's that which we cannot get, give words to. One of the, I'll say this again later, but one of the sneaky and horrible things about trauma is that it steals language, which really sucks for preachers. <laughs> right? I mean, let's be honest, that really sucks for preachers. But one of the tricky things is it steals language because it exists outside our capacity to make sense of it. So, four fabulous reasons why it's hard to define. I'm going to try anyway. And so I want to offer you a, what I call my working definition. And what I will tell you is this definition has gone through so many shifts over time that one of the hardest things about signing off on the last sheets, uh, sheets of, of the book was the editor was like, you know, like, you have to settle on a definition now, right? <laughs> and I was like, bless, no, I don't. Version two. No. Um, was that traumatic? It was. <laughs> as traumatic as the coffee. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But this is actually my working definition, so this is, this is what I have come to, and I'll, I'll break it down for you. But I talk about trauma is a blow or wounding of the mind, body, and spirit self. And for those of you Hebrew scholars in here, that spirit self, I'm thinking of this beautiful Hebrew word nephesh, which means like the whole self. Um, so trauma is really a fully embodied experience, right? Oftentimes we only address the mind, um, and so to the detriment of everything else, or we only address the spirit and we aren't caring for the mind. So thinking about what it means to address trauma as a fully embodied experience. So trauma is a blow or wounding of the mind, body, and spirit self that occurs when a destructive experience or event exceeds a person's or community's resource to process or assimilate that experience into preconceived frameworks of understanding. Let me say this another way, a less nerdy way. Um, we tell stories about our lives, right? We tell stories about who we are, how the world works, who God is, right? We, we tell these stories that, that shape our lives, that give us direction, that help us feel like the world is safe and, and manageable, right? Well, the problem is, is that if we have all these stories, let's have this be the stories, 
The problem is that a traumatic experience, the trauma can't find a home in those stories. It lives outside our capacity to fold it into our story or our multiple stories. So all of a sudden, the experience that we had just doesn't fit in the stories that we've told. It can't be assimilated into or make, be made sense of by the way we've understood how the world has worked before or how, who God is or who we are or who our community is. And so these experiences exist kind of outside of our capacity to integrate them, to make sense of them in relation to everything else we had thought to be true. Are you with me? Perfect. So for me, I think the most important thing, though, is thinking about the impacts of trauma. And I think there's two foundational impacts. And the first is a crisis of time. And so if you have this experience that can't fit in, that we can't make sense of, right, that that trauma, that traumatic experience, becomes a kind of perpetual, eternal present. It just keeps existing. And this is where we have things like flashbacks, triggers. Um, this is this distortion of time. And so this, there's a kind of disconnection or distortion between past, present, and future. Because if you have these experiences that can't fit into the story, all of a sudden it mixes up time. Yeah. The past, present, and future get mixed up. Another way to say it is the past that you lived did not lead to the present you expected. And therefore, it's almost impossible to imagine a future. And so there's this crisis of time that happens. Um, the other crisis that happens is a crisis of coherence, where one's world, one's story, no longer feels comprehensible, right? It no longer makes sense. Um, my dissertation work, which started this whole journey, um, I focused a lot on mass shootings. And I had the opportunity to witness interviews of parents of, uh, who lost children in Newtown and um, got to talk to pastors who served during that time. And one of the things, like if I had, I wish I would have kept a tally but I wish I would have noted how many times people would say, it just doesn't make sense. Or I wake up every morning and it still doesn't make sense. Right? And this idea that it's just not comprehensible, that no matter how long we live with it, it just, it, it doesn't, we can't make sense of it. Also, it makes it feel so that our world, our stories, the ways we've understood ourselves in the world, no longer feel safe or helpful. Right? The stories we've told, they didn't get us through this traumatic experience in a good way. And so oftentimes we feel like the stories that we've told about who we are, who God is, who our family is, who our community is, they no longer feel safe or helpful uh, to navigate the world well. And the last thing that kind of happens is a loss then of meaning. Are these stories even worth preserving? Are these beliefs worth having? <clears throat> And there's a way that with this crisis of coherence, there's both kind of everyday meaningful meaning loss, like who am I, right? And then there's these existential ones about God. Are we good? Yeah. You guys are going through trauma 101 real quick. So. so I actually, and John previewed this, thank you. I actually have coined a term that I think is a really helpful way to think about this, which is the combination of this crisis of time and crisis of coherence is an experience I call narrative fracture. Mm -hmm. And it's a really helpful term for a couple of reasons, but one of it which is, I want to be really clear. Notice it doesn't say narrative obliteration, narrative decimation. P there is a way that the history of trauma studies have, have often treated traumatized persons and communities as if they lose all capacity. But that is not true. We are deeply resilient people. Um, we know this. And so I want to be clear that what happens is not a complete wipeout of who a person is or what they can do. But it is instead the fact that their stories fall to pieces. Um, one of the visuals I think about is, is if you have all these, this experience trying to break into the stories, that it kind of breaks the stories apart. And so when I talk to clergy, a lot of times I say, when I imagine a person experiencing trauma or a community experiencing trauma coming to me, I imagine them coming with a basket of pieces that narratively fractured story in a basket of pieces. And they're coming and saying, I need this basket blessed, and then I need a companionship for rebuilding. And rebuilding narrative fracture is really challenging but really powerful 
Because part of that role is sorting through pieces. Because there may be pieces you pick up and say, this doesn't apply anymore. For example, my um, uncle uh, lost, uh, my, my aunt passed away very suddenly of cancer fairly young. And I remember sitting in Panero. I happened to live in the same city. We were both living in Atlanta at the time. And he was like, can we talk? Well, that turned into weekly four-hour theology sessions in Panera. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember sitting with him as he started to recognize that the theology he had lived with mm -hmm. thus far, it was more of a what I would call a hallmark theology, right? It would fit in a card. And it had helped him up to this point, right? And like, I don't want to down it because it helped him up to this point. But it no longer could work. And so he would pull out a piece and say, I don't know if I can believe this anymore. Help me with a new piece. And then some pieces he would pull and reassemble, right? And of course, the story that we build back is never, ever, ever going to be the same as the stories that we told before, right? There's always going to be a newness to it. But one of the things that's helpful to me about narrative fracture is thinking about what happens when the stories fall to pieces, but that we have the raw material to rebuild. Y'all with me? All right. So something that is especially challenging, uh, particularly for community leaders, preachers, pastors, is that there is individual trauma, and then there is collective or communal trauma. And collective or communal trauma is different from and more than simply the assemblage of individual traumas. The way I like to say it is 1 plus 1 plus 1 does not equal 3. It is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus the collective or communal trauma. And so at the same time individuals are experiencing trauma, the, co the community is also experiencing narrative fracture as a community, right, as a collective. And collective trauma, so they're experiencing this narrative fracture, it has two forces. The first is a uniting force, and it unites in a couple different ways. We all know this, right? After a tragedy, um, we all rush to help. Right? Um, we all do blood drives, or we collect water, or we raise money, or we send a mission teams down. Right? Um, the thing about that is we know that that dissipates very quickly. It is grounded in urgency. Um, we know this. I look at a great example of this is the war in Ukraine. It's in over a year of war in Ukraine. When it first started, we were all galvanized. Right? We came together. We raised money. We hung our flags. We um, you know, we sent, sent uh, supplies, we welcomed refugees, right? And now it's, we don't talk about it. It's not a thing. And so it's not, not to shame, it's not a shame thing here, but to say that, um, that that initial galvanization of a community, that initial coming together is not permanent, right? It's very much based on urgency. The other way that collective trauma can pull communities together is it brings together what I call subgroups of the equally wounded. And so within an experience, right, so just parents who lost children, just people whose houses were destroyed in the hurricane, right, that there are ways that people come together as these kind of subgroups of the equally wounded. And at first, these are really helpful groups, right? It's important to be with people who you don't have to explain everything to, right? However, one of the problems that happens over time is that the bar of entry into that group is real high. And so there's not a lot of folks coming and going. And what ends up happening is that subgroup starts to pull away from the main community because they feel like the main community is not caring for them and the main community feels like they are not being allowed to care. And so there's kind of a push-pull away. And so you end up with these kind of fractured subgroups of the equally wounded. And we see this a lot um, when I studied, uh, I talked to the priest in Newtown five years after um, the, the shooting, and he said, yeah, my, I have three pieces in my community. I have three communities that I serve, all in one parish. And one of them is the people who were here, um, the parents who lost, lost children, right, the people who were directly impacted. There's the group of people who lived here but were not impacted, and there's the group of people who moved here since. And he's like, and the, uh, particularly the people who moved here since and the people who are directly impacted do not mix. And they fight over how the church should honor this. 
and they have they 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 fight over whether or not we should talk about it. And so this is one of the ways that collective trauma works. And it can happen both within communities and between communities. And I saw this most recently with the most recent hurricane in Florida. A bunch of different communities were impacted, right? Because the storm went right up, right up the coast. And uh, at first, all the communities kind of came together. And I have friends who are pastors down there who shared with me this, some of this story. And uh, then they said, all of a sudden, within a couple weeks, the communities started battling with each other. Because those communities that were most deeply impacted joined together and said, no, we get resources. We don't care about your situation. Like, right. And there's a way that the community started kind of peeling off as these subgroups. The other thing collective trauma does is it has separating forces. And it tears communities apart. And you see I have some concentric circles here. I like to think about traumatic impact as concentric circles, that there are those in the middle who are most impacted, go out and out, less impacted, less impacted. And so communities fracture along two lines. So I have a question for you. How many of you have been in a community that has had zero conflict? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for not raising your hand. Of course we haven't, because we live in communities of human beings. And human beings innately have conflict. But what happens with collective trauma is that there becomes a peeling apart of unresolved uh, or unaddressed conflict. So that conflict that lives just under the surface, that we're just able to kind of brush over and live without, or those little fissures, they become gaping chasms. And this happens, first of all, because uh, collective trauma exacerbates those arguments, right? exacerbates those conflicts. The other reason it often happens is because those conflicts are easier to focus on than the actual trauma itself. So here's a story. Uh, I have a friend, one of my best friends, uh, is a pastor, a United Methodist pastor in Virginia. And she, uh, before the pandemic, her church had agreed as an act of sustainability to purchase uh, uh, what she called permanent flowers for the communion table. So fake flowers. But I love the language of permanent flowers. I think it's lovely. Um, and they decided that that was what they were going to do because they were just tired of buying fresh cut flowers, the same arrangement every week, right? <laughs> And uh, so then the pandemic happened. It shut everything down, so they didn't get the flowers. They reopened. They came back. They kind of got their, their feet back under them a little bit, and they said, okay, then, and her council said, okay, it's time. Let's, let's move forward with buying the flowers. They bought the flowers. Flowers went up. The church erupted <laughs> in arguments over these permanent flowers. <laughs> and I remember she called me, and she said, Kim, please, told me this whole story. And she said, Kim, please tell me this is not about the flowers. <laughs> and I said, it's about 4% about the flowers. <laughs> but it's about 96% about the trauma and the change that your community is experiencing, and they have nowhere else to put it. Mm -hmm. And those flowers represent change. And they're easier to argue over than to argue over the trauma of the pandemic and how it has changed your community. Mm -hmm. Right? So we get these fault lines of unaddressed, unresolved conflict um, that are exacerbated by uh, collective trauma, but also are, um, it's easier to fight over the little things than the real thing. The other way that um, communities peel apart is along fault lines of proximity. So I talked about the um, nesting circles, the concentric circles. Oftentimes, communities will pull apart along these circles. We have a natural allergy right, to trauma, to suffering, to hurt. We, brain science tells us that we are just naturally resisting pain and hurt. And so it is a natural instinct when we see people really suffering to actually our bodies naturally want to pull away. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our task as people of faith, as communities of faith, as leaders, as preachers, is to try to get folks to lean back in, um, to not be scared of that, of that hard. All right, are we good? Questions. You guys just passed Trauma 101 with Kim Wagner. Yeah. It's interesting that you, you talk about that natural allergy. I love that phrase. Um, but, but people also 
we love trauma in our society. I mean, people are like, oh, you know, we can't live without trauma. I would love it, but people are just addicted, and it's nothing else but our social media shows that. Yeah, it's a, there's a fetishizing of trauma that's happening right now, um, which makes my work really hard, um, because I'm like, no, 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 let's talk about what really happens. But there's a way that I think you're right. People, when trauma happens, people naturally pull away. But we love to watch it. Right. Right? Um, we like to be voyeurs of trauma. And part of the reason, this is my, th this is a Kim Wagner theory, so don't. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I think we like to be voyeurs of trauma, of others' trauma, is because it makes us feel safe. Yeah. It is an actually a protective mechanism that says, if I can know, this is why the news, when, when, particularly when shootings happen, the news, one of the first things they identify is what? Shooter and motive. Yeah. And the reason is, is because it makes their viewer feel safe. I didn't know that person, that couldn't happen to me, that couldn't happen here, right? Um, and having lived on the south side of Chicago for four and plus years, I watched the difference between the way shootings were reported on the north side and on the south side. And the north side, it was so important to have a motive, right? And the south side, it was literally, it made me so angry. It still makes me angry. It was literally just a list on a Sunday paper, like a small, tiny column. No motive, no nothing. It was just assumed. This is what happens in Chicago. Um, but, uh, though, so I think some of the fetishization of trauma, it's really important to recognize that that's not actual genuine interest in addressing and talking about trauma. It's interest in being a voyeur of others' trauma as an act of safety. There's a distancing that can happen there. Um, but also there's like a kind of just wicked fascination with it. Which makes, like I said, makes my job super hard because everyone on TikTok's a trauma expert. I don't know if you knew this. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, are we ready to are we ready to solve it? <laughs> I no, we are not solving it today. We're going to address it though. So I want to think about how our preaching, our liturgy, our worship, our faithful acts together might address some of these um, traumatic realities. And the very first thing is I think we can offer language to one another. Um, I told you earlier one of the ridiculously hard things about trauma is that it steals language. It steals our capacity for language. And so one of the things that I think preaching can do, teaching, um, worship, liturgy, it can give us some language to borrow until we can find our own language again. Right? It offers us language to describe what has happened to even offer language of emotion that helps us grasp on to how we are feeling and gives us language for our emotion. Um, and it gives language for what has been lost, right? Because oftentimes when a traumatic event happens, particularly a mass traumatic event, like a mass violence, natural disaster, public health crisis, we talk about what's going on in the crisis. But there's also these other losses, a loss of a sense of safety, a loss of trust in science, a loss of trust in our community, in government, right? Whatever it is, there's all these different losses that also happen. And so I think preaching and liturgy can faithfully offer us some language to at least borrow until we have the language that we need. I think another thing uh, that preaching and liturgy can do is it can create some space for honest reflection. You all know this, one of the tendencies when something happens is we all spring into action. And I love that impulse, especially this church, people of faith, we want to help. But the problem is, is we sometimes also need to reflect about what's actually going on, right, and how it's impacting us and what has happened. And so I think preaching and liturgy and worship can, can give us some space for honest reflection amid all of the action. I think the, the third thing is, is I think that preaching and liturgy can model faithful traumatic response. I'll talk about this in a minute. But there is a temptation for clergy, preachers, community leaders to want to take the position of like, I'm going to go fix it. But you can't. And also, if it is a truly a collective traumatic event, you too are impacted. Right? <coughs> clergy does not exist outside. One of the hardest things um, was during COVID, I was doing a lot of just webinars with clergy groups about this. And I said, what I witnessed was so many clergy, so here's our, concept. the concentric circles are back, people. Um, in the concentric circles, they wanted to pretend they were outside. 
because it's easy to minister it easier to minister in from the outside. Caring for each other from the inner circle to the inner circles is really, really hard. But if we try to pretend we're coming in from the outside, then um, that's how you get burnout. That's how you get clergy who um, think that they have to kind of invent solutions. And instead, I think preaching and worship can model faithful traumatic response, can be willing to ask questions, right, and not just have answers, to be willing to wrestle with the congregation, with one another, about what's going on. Um, I think preaching and liturgy can also facilitate communal connection, support, and empathy. I talked about the community pulling apart, right? What do we do to hear one another's stories? And this happens not just in preaching and liturgy, um, but in the ways we share our stories over fellowship, how we run Bible studies, right? How we engage our fellowship groups. What does it mean to let people tell their stories so that folks can lean in? Um, and it pushes against some of that, that divisiveness. I think preaching and liturgy, it centers us in the patterns of our life together and the stories of our faith. One of the challenging things about um, when a community encounters a mass traumatic event is sometimes that experience becomes so defining and they get stuck there. And that now becomes the foundation of their identity. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to think about how we remind communities that they are more than the traumatic event. Right, And so to remember that we have stories of faith that can include, not erase, include our traumatic realities, but that we are more than just the trauma. right? And so being mindful that um, we want to nurture the stories of faith um, and the stories of identity that are include but are beyond the traumatic reality. And lastly, I think... Uh, Worship and uh, preaching and liturgy remind us that we're not alone. Not only that we're not alone as a community, but that we're not alone. We have witnesses in scripture of people dealing with trauma. There's a lot of trauma in scripture. A lot of people going through traumatic events and communal traumatic events, and we'll actually uh, spend some time with the Israelites here at the end. Um, but the, I think it reminds us we're not alone. All right, let me check my time. Rock and roll one. All right, so how do we do this? I think what we have to do is preach and minister and, 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 and engage theologically in this tension between brokenness, death, and loss, and hope, redemption, and resurrection. That we live in the tension between these things. And the temptation is to collapse it one way or another, right? One way we can collapse it is we go to the brokenness, loss, death side, and we think, like, that is all we can talk about, friends, all we can do is sit here and lament. This is horrible. Everything's terrible. And the, the intention's good, right, to, to honor the brokenness, to honor the hurt. The problem is, is if there's no hope, no resurrection, we are missing the presence of Christ in the place and the work of the gospel. And what I want to be clear about is sometimes we're going to preach and teach and minister and care for one another over on this end of the ark. And we may just be holding a thread of the promise of hope. Not hope we're experiencing yet, but the thread of the promise of hope. And then the other temptation is to collapse the other way, right? And we do it in a couple ways. One is we do the whole, like, God's got it. It'll be okay in the sweet by and by. <laughs> you know, just have faith. And while I believe those things are, have truth to them, they are unhelpful, at best and hurtful at worst when people are experiencing trauma because at best they just feel out of touch right of what's actually going on at worst it implies that until you are living over here you are not welcome and or your pain your hurt your brokenness is somehow beyond the grace of God and so we want to resist collapsing and preach in the tension. The other way I see folks collapsing over here is I have a um, pastor uh, that I'm mentoring in, in her doctor of ministry program, and she is a pastor on the south side of Chicago of a, a largely African-American congregation, Lutheran congregation, one of the few all African-American Lutheran congregations in Chicago. And she, uh, they had a young woman killed by a straight bullet during COVID. 
And she said, well, we weren't able to do the funeral. It was right at the start of COVID. And, and I said, well, have you done anything since you all have come back together? She goes, not really. I said, do you talk about it? She goes, oh, no. And I was like, let's talk about this. Like, because, well, I, she's a really good pastor. And I was like, this is a really interesting choice. And she knows her congregation better than I do. But her thought was, they can literally hear the gunshots outside of church when they are worshiping. Why do I need to bring it up? And my suggestion was because, so I said, I get that impulse, right? The impulse is I'm going to preach a counter narrative to what is happening in the world. But the problem is if you don't acknowledge what's happening in the world, this counter narrative feels fanciful, right? It isn't taking seriously death and brokenness. And so she, she took me at my word, and they had a service, I guess this is a month ago now, because she called me, and where she talked, preached directly on this young woman's death. And I said, how'd it go? And she goes, oh, Kim, everyone has called me to thank me. And I was like, are you kidding? And she goes, no. She goes, the last time I don't listen to you. I was like, remember that? <laughs> no, no, no. But, I, but it's because I think finally this community was able to name that brokenness in holy space. There is something really important and powerful about acknowledging brokenness on holy ground. And for someone in a pulpit to stand up and name it, even as they name the promise of hope, right? And so my invitation to you, those of you who are preachers, but those of your teachers, community leaders, to think really clearly about where you preach in this tension. And sometimes you'll find yourself preaching over here, right? Right after an event has happened, at the anniversary of an event, when something, you know, happens. I remember being with a community, we moved back over this way when the court case started, right? Um, sometimes you'll preach more in the middle, and sometimes even, I like to say to preachers, even on the most beautiful, sunny, pre-pandemic Easter, I hope you'll preach over here. And that's because Resurrection doesn't matter if there's not brokenness in the world. We don't need resurrection if everything's great. And so acknowledging brokenness and practicing this theology that holds tension, we hold it in trust for each other and ourselves as we um, preach for when we need it. And we have theological and biblical resources for this, right? We've been gifted theology and sacred texts. The Psalms are the best. I love the Psalms. I love a good lament psalm that, because the, uh, the, the, the psalmist will be like, woe is me, I'm but a worm. God is so great. <laughs> the bulls surround me. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord. What? <laughs> But they're able to hold the tension between brokenness and hope, right, with no interlude in between. They just move back and forth between those, not because they can't decide, but because both those things are true. Amen. Brokenness is true, but redemption is also true. And so they hold them in that tension. So the Psalms do this really well. Um, I borrowed this. My Luther, I, I, Before I was at Princeton, I taught up at Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. So I stole this from my Lutheran friends. They talk about what it means to be simultaneously saint and sinner. Right? We made, in the Reformed tradition, fallen and redeemed. Right? That we can simultaneously, we live as people who are both hurting and broken and redeemed. We know how to do this. And then, of course, we have death and resurrection. I often think about preaching and trauma-sensitive and trauma-responsive preaching as existing in Holy Saturday space. Mm -hmm. right? Good Friday has happened. The death has happened. The loss has happened. The shooting has happened. right? And Easter's coming. And it's already on its way. Resurrection's coming, but we're not fully there yet. And so we preach in this Holy Saturday space. We exist. We minister in this Holy Saturday space. And Let's be clear, it's not just any Saturday. It's Holy Saturday. So we trust that the resurrection is already on its way. And so as we preach in the tension, I think this image of Holy Saturday is a really helpful one. I think it matters too, and I go into this deeply in the book. We won't dive in super uh, long today because I want to uh, make sure we have time for conversation. But that I think we can honor narrative fracture uh, of communities and of individuals not only in what we say, but in how we say it. If we always try to end uh, a sermon 
or even a Bible study lesson with a nice neat bow of like, so God's got it. It kind of goes against the very thing that we've been saying, right? If we always are trying to end with happily ever after in the form of the sermon, in the form of how we teach, then we end up counteracting the very thing we are saying, which is it is faithful to live in this tension. And so what does it mean in the forms we say, in the way we say it, to not rush to easy answers, to not to resist moving to easy resolutions? Um, ending sermons with a question? I know, right? Um, but to think about what it means to hold that tension and let people carry that with them mm-hmm. and to not so quickly um, tie it off with a, with a pretty bow or a pretty ending. Um, so the role of the preacher pastor, I, I mentioned this earlier. So there's a, there's a way that preachers and ministers, uh, uh, and I think all of us as people of faith, we, we want to fix it, right? Something happens and we're like, this is my moment. I am superhero. I will fix it. I will come in from the outside. And yet the problem is, is that we can't come in from the outside. We are in it. Um, and we are in it with our community. And so one of the images that I have found to be really helpful for me um, and for my communities has been that of Habakkuk, the, the, the minor prophet. If you haven't read Habakkuk recently, highly recommend it. Super short, only three chapters, won't take you long. <laughs> but Habakkuk 1 starts with Habakkuk crying out to God because the city in which he's lived has been destroyed. It has been taken over. Um, there is, and, and the, what I love about this book is normally in the minor prophets, there's a whole like introduction, like once upon a time, there was a prophet who lived in this land and this was what was going on. This one is like, there's a prophet named Habakkuk. Why, oh Lord? Like, it's just like, I mean, Habakkuk wastes no time. And it gets right into crying out to God. And the whole first chapter is Habakkuk just lamenting. And God responds, and God's response, I'm paraphrasing here, is like, yeah, this sucks. Um, <laughs> that's not, I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, right? Um, but, this, but it is, the first half of the first chapter is Habakkuk crying to God. The second half of the first chapter is uh, God saying, like, yeah, this is bad. Like, I agree with you. This is terrible. And then Chapter 1 ends with, with Habakkuk being like, yeah, it is, and goes back into lament. And then you flip the page to chapter 2. And while lament is still on Habakkuk's lift, lips, he says, I will, but I will go up and I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what the Lord will say to me and what the Lord will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk says, okay, I'm going to go up to the fortified city wall. And I'm going to stand up there. And here's the thing. That's not a point of escape, right? In fact, he could probably see the destruction of the city better from up there. But what he does is positions himself to see where God is coming and positions himself in the midst of lament but looking for the the presence and hope and answer of God. And I think this is our call as people of faith and as preachers and as pastors is to position ourselves in lament with our community and yet anticipating that God will answer. Habakkuk trusts that God will answer, and God shows up and says, yep, and if it tarries, wait for it. I I don't do well with that. We won't get into that. (laughs) The waiting is not not a fun place to be, but Habakkuk's position to me is so much more helpful than this kind of superhero position, right, or this kind of fixer position, or even a shepherd position. Habakkuk is both with fully in and with the community, but is also one who is anticipating God's work. And that is what my invitation is to pa- pastors and preachers and, and leaders as we think about contending with trauma. All right, I know I'm running over time, but I would like to finish. Can I do this last thing? You can finish. I can finish? Thank you. Um, so, I think one of the really helpful things is I said I want to turn to our biblical ancestors. And we've already talked about Habakkuk and the Psalms. And, but uh, the Israelites are some of my favorite because every time the Israelites are in the wilderness, they are going through collective trauma. So, the first, like, they're in the wilderness, right, leaving Egypt, 
And the trauma there is that they are dealing with uh, a life of slavery, they're dealing with that, and then they're um, homeless, and they decide to take a 40-year detour, right? <laughs> they're experiencing collective trauma. The next time we see them in the wilderness, they are being dragged off into exile. Their city has been destroyed, their temple has been destroyed, and then the third time they're in the wilderness is on their way back from exile, contending with collectively what it means to be back from exile, to move back. So I want to offer four pieces of wisdom from the wilderness wanderings. And they, we could, I'm just picking four. And the very first one is I think it's important to recognize with the exilic people the painful traumatic reality and grieve what has been lost. The Psalms, the prophets, lamentation are so good at naming and crying out about what has been lost. Not just, we're in exile, this sucks. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? What does it mean to lose our voice? To lose our capacity to make music? Right? Um, and so to, to recognize that. The second is the importance of cultivating right or truthful memory. So uh, those of you who are in the know, Exodus 16 is famously when God gave manna from heaven in the wilderness. Right? We remember that? Well, right before that, um, the Israelites shockingly were whining um, in the wilderness, and they go up to Aaron and Moses, and they say, we are starving. And this is my favorite line. They say, if only you had left us in Egypt, where we laid by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Mm. No, you didn't. <laughs> I've read the book. <laughs> You were slaves in Egypt. You were oppressed in Egypt. We know, there was no point where you, this was vacation and you were laying by your flesh pots and eating your fill of bread. That's a false memory. That's not real. But the thing about collective trauma is oftentimes it, we create a golden age that never was. Mm, come on now. Yeah. Right? We create a world that we think existed before. I know this has happened with... Um, I remember I went and worshipped with a familiar congregation in uh, Chicago, and I remember I went and worshipped, and they, they came, one of the older uh, folks came up to me afterwards and said, oh, Kim, I wish you'd been here. I Like, before the pandemic, oh, the pews were full. <laughs> the choir was glorious every Sunday. <laughs> the preaching, transformational every week. The coffee <laughs> was great. And I, I laughed, and I was like, no, I was here before the pandemic. <laughs> and it was good. But the pews weren't always full. The choir wasn't always glorious. The preaching wasn't always spectacular. I know because I preached there a couple times. And, uh, you know, the coffee was coffee. You know, but there was a way that we cultivate these false memories of the before times, right, of before the traumatic event. And the problem with that is twofold. One is, it's a false memory. It's not truthful. The other problem is, it somehow sets us up so we feel we have fallen further than we actually have. Right? That we have somehow, um, that, that, that where we are now is so far from where we were, which may or may not be as true as we think it is. Third lesson from Wilderness Wanderings is that there is no true return. When the Israelites come back from exile, um, they could stand on the same street corner with the same person, and it would not be the same. The world had changed, and they had changed. Trauma changes us. It lingers. It changes who we are. changes how we understand the world. We repair our narratively fractured stories in new ways, right? Um, and so there's this kind of temptation to want to get back to what once was. And we see this all the time. Like, this is a very common response. But the recognition is we need to honor the fact that we do not, there is no true return to what was before. There can be a new reality, mm -hmm. right? This is not being hopeless, but we have to let go of, which is why it's so important, as I said in the first point, to grieve what has been lost, mm -hmm. right? To grieve the ways we've worshipped that have been lost or the ways we've been in community, right? And then the other question I always ask is, do we truly want to return? What have we learned that now needs to be included in that repaired story of our life together?
And finally, I think we are invited to ground ourselves in who we are and God's claim on us and in our formative sacred stories. Um, again and again, when we read Psalms, when we read prophets of Israelites in the wilderness, one of the things that these writers come back to again and again is the foundational story of the Exodus and the foundational story of creation. And they tell again and again and again and again the stories that form this community with and beyond the traumatic reality. And I think we too, we, we in the midst of our kind of traumatic disorientation, can reorient ourselves and one another in who we are and trust that these stories are held in trust for us until we can believe them again. I am going to stop there wow. and wow. Yeah. invite questions. You don't need a moderator for this part. No, I... Take it, go for it. Yeah. Number one, Prince is really lucky to have you. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Number two, your perspective on this. Um, do you draw a distinction between acute trauma and subacute trauma? And I'm thinking specifically of our political environment. Absolutely. Um, yeah, those slides didn't make it in. There's lots of versions of this. You know, there's, there's the nine, you know, nine-week class of this. But, um, so yeah, no, I think it's really important. Uh, trauma, there's lots of kind of categories of trauma. And there's acute trauma, right? So those events that happen. That, um, and so this book is largely on kind of acute mass trauma. Um, but then there's perpetual and perpetuating traumas. Um, and so we can think about those as ongoing kind of abuse. This is where we can talk about political divisiveness, right? I'll get back to political divisiveness in just a second. And then there's individual traumas, and then there's generational and historical trauma, and then there's also secondary trauma, right, which is the trauma that people who are caregivers experience being in proximity um, to and caring for people experiencing trauma. I have a friend who's doing some amazing work on secondary trauma and EMT workers. Um, and thinking about how to care for EMT workers who witness trauma but have long been treated as like, oh, no, you're just, like, you can somehow separate from that. Back to the political thing, too. Real quick. Um, I think there's a couple things going on. I do think it is a source of trauma. I also think it is traumatically induced, and that is that I think we as a nation have a lot of traumatic realities we have not dealt with fully, correctly, or well. And so, you remember how I talked about the exacerbation of divisions when um, traumatic collective trauma happens? I think that we have an ex that the pandemic, particularly, but all of the traumatic realities of the last five to eight years, have drastically sped up the chasm of political divide. So, what's hard about po the politics piece is it is both a source of traumatic realities. It is both a traumatic source as well as the result of trauma, an unaddressed trauma. So, yeah. Picking up on that theme. Yes. Because, uh, you know, for me, the, the spiritual and, and, and um, biblical aspects to it are important, but if I don't connect it to my day-to-day -day <coughs> living, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Absolutely. And so there's a sense, and I mean, there's a lot of things I was thinking as you were talking about the basic elements, but there's a sense in me of that one of the reactions of part of, of our culture, and this is more on the collective, mm -hmm. is to this, well, two things. One, to manufacture a traumatic um, source yes. to our complaints and then because of that create an avoidance mm -hmm. of it by refusing to allow others to even talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so good. Uh, this is like... Kim, can you repeat a little of that? Yeah, so, so the question was about how, um, how we <coughs> contend with the idea of people who want to avoid the trauma who want to pretend it doesn't exist, or um, who are who manufacture kind of traumatic sources that aren't real. Um, uh.
get back to me in five years. Um, no, I. Uh, so two things to say. That is, One. That is my thought. Of it. No, I absolutely. Talk, I, I talk in great generalities and a lot of ways, but comes in our failure and and or challenges to dealing with racism and. and our absolutely racism. no. Uh, so one of the things that I, so two things that I want to say to this is the first is that oftentimes we will manufacture traumatic realities to avoid uh, getting close to pain. Um, and so to kind of imagine that, but we can get where I think your question is at the heart of it. And the part I think I'm more equipped to address is this idea of how do we people who pull away from wanting to even address it or talk about it or pretend it exists. And one of the things that I think this is the role the church has of inviting people to lean in and to have empathy and to hear one another's story um, becomes really critical. The other thing is, is recognizing that oftentimes that pull away, this gives me more compassion with people who frustrate. So I get very frustrated when people are like, no, this isn't real. And I'm like, no, this is very, very deeply real. Um, is to recognize that that itself is a trauma response. Um, and so it gives me a little more compassion to invite their story, because um, a lot of times there's a reason why the pull away is so extreme. Um, and then it's this kind of persistent invitation to lean in. Um, and uh, you just kind of keep inviting and keep telling those stories, right? Telling the stories of your community and your friends and things like that. Um, but it's going to take, no one can force anyone to take trauma seriously, whether you have it, whether you're leading a community that has it. But what we can do is constantly invite a recognition. And a lot of the reason I do the biblical work is because I think if we can start seeing our reflection in these stories, we can then invite folks to more honest conversation. Um, it's easier, it's the kind of way of the fetishizing of, of trauma, but it's, we can talk about it when it's out here, and then we bring it in a little closer with these biblical stories, and then maybe we're able to start talking about it, how this reflects in our own culture. So for me, it's very invitational, it takes time, it takes commitment, and it takes a certain amount of patience and understanding that part of what we're experiencing is a kind of trauma response. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure this is a question, but in a little more you know, practical and specific to, to <clears throat> folks who are, who are members of our congregation, and, yeah. and our perception at least is, is is that they've withdrawn or quietly separated during during the past mm -hmm. uh, few years. Um, and, and I think our, the perception I have collectively as, as a church is we either, we either attribute too much um, like uh, um, volition to their action, like oh well, correct. Sure, they, yeah. they have lots of reasons to do this, and who can blame them? And and um, and and that totally makes sense, or or not enough. Saying saying like they don't know what they're doing. They, they you know they surely they're not thinking about the community or or their well-being. Um, so I get I guess just just um, you know some some thoughts about how to how to you know, make, make that approach, or, or if it's not an approach, just, just how to continue to love yeah. and love for yeah. people in that position. No, it's so hard. Um, so the first thing to say is I think, uh, again, I'm going to go back to the word of invitation, that it's always an open invitation, but also an acknowledgement that, um, that there may be need to be a way to bless people along their way. Right, an act of an actual like ritual act of blessing people along their way. Um, so let me address both sides of that. One is to say, if you make the approach and if you want to talk to them, to invite them to share not just why they're leaving the church, but like what is going on in the world for you, like what is happening. Because a lot of times, a lot of folks who are pulling away from the church are doing so because the pandemic has now allowed them to do that. Right, it's given them a reason to do it, and they may have already kind of emotionally, spiritually pulled away. Um, and so to talk with them about that and see kind of what their, their what what needs are not being met, but also kind of what, because um, the church is not Walmart, we don't sell things, right? Um, but also what is their way of making community in this new world? Um, I think one of the biggest things is our communities have so collapsed um, due to the trauma of the pandemic and the reality of the pandemic that 
we're having to re-navigate how we make community. And so thinking with people about like, what, how are you making community? Whether or not that's with our church um, and asking those questions about community making. Um, and then I also think that when people decide to move to something next, to bless them on their way is really powerful and important because it actually is an act of claiming them and that their story still matters in the congregation even if they aren't there anymore. Um, and it's a nice thing for them, but even more, it's a nice thing for the congregation to be able to kind of say goodbye well and not feel like, oh my gosh, we're leeching people, right? Because the panic of leeching people is real. And the panic of leeching people is also um, picking up on, it's producing anxiety that only leads to more people feeling disconnected. Because one of the lies trauma tells is that we, our experience is so unique that no one can help us or accompany us. Um, and so one of the ways to kind of invite folks to accompany each other, um, even if it's accompanying each other to say goodbye. I don't know if any of that's helpful to you. Okay. We had a question over there. One there and then one there. there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the question, and this is way too big, I know, so you can just bounce back and say, read my book, which I'll do. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> which is the question that some of us may feel we want to ask um, when people come to you and say, but, but, but why? Mm -hmm. Why? This is all lovely, and I'm a clinical social worker, so I come from, you know, the, the defense mechanisms are just rampant throughout all the responses, right? But, but why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But why? Yeah. I mean, so. <laughs> there is no answer. There is no answer. But where is God? Where is That's God? where I redirect the question. So to me, that why question is really, it's asking why did this happen? It's trying, it's that seeking for meaning, right? Seeking for comprehensibility. Um, but then there are other questions that I think we can begin to approach, which is where is God in this? Where are you in your relationship to yourself and to God and your community? You know, how are you, um, how are you seeing what has fallen, fallen apart, right? How are you? And so I kind of break it down to more relational questions. Um, I find that to be a really helpful way to refocus folks because the why question, part of the problem with the why question, it's not just that we can't answer it. I tell people, excuse my French, I have a deep theology of shit happens, right? Um, and I mean that not jokingly, but I mean that like there is traumatic suffering that cannot be explained and that I don't even know I kind of, there's a piece of me that wants to get to heaven and God say, like, yeah, that one sucks. Like, I kind of want the answer, Habakkuk got, you know, on some of these things. But then you want to say why. Well, why do you want to why? Know? But the problem with why is it's because, first problem with why is it's unanswerable. The second problem with why is it's so big and it takes over the capacity to notice what is actually happening it becomes this kind of meta question that then can shield us from actually asking questions that are going to begin to allow a person experiencing trauma to tell their story, to repair, to recover. Um, and so that's when I kind of move from like, I don't know why, but I can, but I do wonder where God is. I'm wondering how you are describing how you are feeling right now. I'm wondering, right, and so moving to those relational questions, relation to God, relation to the world, relation to the community, relation to the self, can oftentimes um, help toward the why, even if the why never is answerable. But the problem with why is it's so blanketing. And the why is actually can often be used, too, as a kind of barrier to actually telling the story. Because if you have to have the why at the end of the story, you'll never start telling the story. But we have to start telling the story. We have to start repairing this narrative. Um, and the why question is just too much as a starting place for doing that repair. All right. Question. And then we'll be done. OK, so this is almost more comment, I think. But I love, and thank you, Kim. So thank you. And everything that you've offered today. But I love what you've said about offering the language and offering the narrative. I think we have so much work to do in the church, and you reflected on a lot of it, but we aren't, we don't grow into maturity, really, with our biblical narrative. Um, you know, we start out, for instance, teaching about Noah to little kids, and we have an ark, right? And we have cute little animals in pairs, and I've had people say to me as adults, 
Yeah, I want to stick with that. I might be 65 years old, but I don't really want to think beyond that. Think about what it was like in that ark for Noah and Mrs. Noah, not to mention the people who drowned outside, and what their world was when they came out of that Absolutely. ark. Absolutely. Um, I mean, talk about trauma. We never talk about stories like that. No. Which the Bible is packed full of. Packed. And I guess I want to say, I hope you read a curriculum one day, because it's very hard as a preacher on Sundays, people want to be uplifted. Right. And um, it's an incredible task to say, address the trauma of a story like that. And at the same time, in your 18 minutes, get back to, well, you know, they came out and everything was fine. Except <laughs> it wasn't fine. No, it wasn't fine. It was a whole new world, like you're talking about. Do we want to go back? Maybe we do, but we can't. Mm -hmm. They can't. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to that in yeah. our sermon? And I guess I just wanted to comment on that. And that I'm so Thank you for naming that. This work on this incredibly important subject. Thank you. Yes, and I agree. I think one of the things that we need to do as preachers is help congregations have tolerance for that good news isn't always happy news. Right? Like the fact that God is present in the midst of Noah and the storm that's good news. That is actually better news to me than, and they lived happily ever after. Because, and they lived happily ever after to me is really unhelpful when I'm going back into a world where it isn't happily ever after. And so I think, and, and it's going to take time, right? It takes nurturing, but nurturing people to recognize the difference between good news and happy news. Um, and I talk a lot about that with my intro to preaching kids. Kids, they're not kids. <laughs> I'm old now, so they feel like kids. And then, yeah. You gave an example of the, the church that became almost like three congregations. Yes. Those who directly experienced the trauma because their children were hurt, those who were witnesses of the trauma, and those who came later and really were kind of not involved. Yeah. Is there an expiration date? Is there a point where the, was that group legitimate in saying, get over it? Is there a point at which you just let it go? I personally am at the point where there's certain things now I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I'm over it. Mm -hmm. Is that a legitimate way to deal with trauma? And last thing, yes. I am definitely in the 4% for whom it really would be about the permanent, the permanent flowers. flowers. I appreciate you yeah. naming that. I'm in the 4%. <laughs> I love it. I'll, I'll, I'll mark it down. I'll, I'll mark it down. Um, so, this is such a great question about kind of trauma and expiration dates. Um, I think that there are, there is not an ex, trauma by definition is what lingers, right? Now, it subsides, right? And so, at, over time, communities should not, we have to strike the balance between honoring that these things are still real. So, for example, on the anniversary of the shooting, right? Like, it's important for that community, even if there's a bunch of people that are like, I don't want to think about it, that we honor that that happened. However, the preacher shouldn't be talking about it every Sunday, right? Um, you also shouldn't be talking about this stuff every Sunday. Um, that's a lot for a community. What I want to say is that I think that there is a balance we need to strike between honoring those who are still experiencing the trauma and not getting stuck on the trauma so that the community's identity is stuck there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so it is a hard dance, and, and different communities are going to take different time to, to manage it. But one of the things to pay attention to is that the trauma is always going to be there. Like, those parents wake up every morning, mm -hmm. and they're... Um, so I think this year they would have graduated high school, mm -hmm. those children that were killed in Newtown. And so, like, there was a big article, and I was, yeah, working on that. And... Um, and, uh, you know, so obviously, like, graduation that, that year was a time when I imagine and hope those pastors stepped forward and acknowledged the trauma in the, in the community, in the space. But that doesn't mean that they went back to what they were doing the day mm -hmm. after the shooting, right? It's acknowledgement and naming, but it's also then inviting the community to both lean into that and to, to carry them forward. Right, and so there's a way I think we have to strike that balance um, between honoring the fact that trauma lingers and not getting stuck so that the whole identity is the trauma. Yeah. Listen, thank you, Kim, so much for your. Thank you. Thank you. You all are wonderful.
It means so much to me. And Thank you. It meant a lot for me. Obviously, everybody just seemed to really be leaning into it. We have opportunities. Please talk amongst yourselves. I'm sure Kim, we I'm and, around. You know, talk. And also, there are books to be bought if you feel so uh, called. And we do have our little clicker. So we're not taking cash. Don't trust me with cash.